Well, let's get started. Good morning. My name is Amy Longsworth. I'm the executive director of the Green Ribbon Commission, and this is a GRCX, <coughs> which is an interactive program from the Green Ribbon Commission. And this morning, we're taking an in-depth look at the Boston Children's Museum Waterfront Initiative. And we have Carol Charnow, the executive director of the museum, and David Healy, the president of the board of the museum, the chairman of the board, and uh, also in, quote, real life, the president of Sun Life Group Benefits. The Children's Museum has a real existential dilemma on its hands. And uh, it is one of the first real has to be done now um, resilience projects that we have in the city of Boston. <coughs> and Carol and David are going to tell you the story of how of, of what they're doing about it. I will say, please put your questions in the chat. We're going to get to the questions later. We are about, um, we have only an hour today. Usually we have an hour and a half, but today we have an hour. So Carol is going to show some slides. Then we will, I have a couple of questions of my own just to kick things off. And then um, your questions are going to come in in the chat, we hope. So uh, I think with that, uh, we're we're ready to roll. So Carol, please. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. And I also want to welcome members of uh, the museum staff and our partners uh, at Sasaki and Arup and VHB, some of whom I think are also in the room. Um, and they have been working on this for the better part of 100 years, I think. <laughs> no, it's actually about five, five years now. But um, um, so I want to get started. We have, oh, if you could go back, Travis, to the first slide. Yeah, so uh, basically, as Amy said, um, we are um, in a very uh, precarious position here uh, on the Four Point Channel. As all of you know, um, Boston Harbor is going to be very vulnerable to sea level rise and the effects of storm surge, groundwater, et cetera. And so uh, we have undertaken to um, to do a, a very comprehensive plan that not only protects the museum, but protects the entire neighborhood behind us and uh, potentially could protect all the way down the channel, uh, specifically because of our place on the channel, which I'll show you in a minute. So uh, we have undertaken a very extensive master plan planning pro uh, process with Sasaki. Um, who many of you know have done a lot of projects like this, and they have also uh, contracted Arup, uh, VHB, Turner Construction, and others to help us to uh, really understand how serious the problem is here and what we can do to solve it. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So how did we get started on this whole thing? Well, if you all remember in 2016, Marty Walsh, announced the Climate Ready Boston plan. And this was a very ambitious plan for how Boston, uh, Boston Harbor was going to uh, deal with uh, increasing sea levels and how uh, analyzing how bad it was gonna get. So um, that was quite a long time ago. And of course, then you'll remember that that plan was broken up into areas. And we had the East Boston plan, the South Boston plan and so forth. Um, then came, uh, Winter Storm Riley. This was in 2018. Uh, many of you may remember that picture on the news of the floating dumpster that was going down the street. Well, that was right behind the Children's Museum. So uh, you can see in the larger picture, um, a picture of how high the water was during Storm Riley. It was only uh, a little bit uh, below coming over on the plaza. But at the same time, we had water coming over Congress Street we had water coming down Seaport Boulevard, and essentially for a short time, we were an island. And this was a major uh, alert to uh, the museum staff and board that something needed to be done. And this is when we actually started in earnest our uh, plans to actually address the problem. You can see this in this inset photograph. Things are getting much worse quite fast. So this was not even a storm. This was just in February. This was a king tide 
that again was bringing the water up to the plaza. Uh, during this particular event, we also had flooding in our loading dock and we had water coming into our mechanical areas and uh, into our doorways on the back of the building on Sleeper Street. So um, the problem is here now, and this is why I think Amy is saying that this is an, an urgent situation and we are addressing this as urgently as we can. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, please, Travis. So here you can see on the left, the actual storm projections um, that are in line with uh, Climate Ready Boston, that Sasaki did this very illustrative uh, drawing for us. Our current Harbor Walk is at 10 feet elevation. And uh, in keeping in line with the plan, we have to get to 14 and a half feet in order to protect the museum all the way up to 2070, which at the moment it's looking like it may even be 2050. Because you can see where it says the king tide at 2070 over on the left is at 10 feet. We already have the king tides in 2024 at 10 feet, at almost 10 feet. So, so these numbers are a little bit out of date and um, we need to act with some degree of urgency. So if you go to the next slide, you can see in this slide where we sit on the Fort Point Channel. So that area in orange and in the dark orange is Boston Children's Museum and then the waterfront area uh, adjacent to Martin's Park. You can see Martin's Park there just below us. This is the area that we can control, which is between Congress and Seaport Boulevard. And you can see how if we are aligned with other initiatives along Fort Point Channel, we have the poten uh, potential to protect a very large area of the Boston neighborhoods. Um, and you can see here, what is the uh, flood risk in this area that's uh, extremely vulnerable to flooding? So the plan that we developed is not only a design to protect the museum, but it's also to de designed to protect the entire area behind us and to be connected to any other plans along our side of the Four Point Channel that would protect the entire South Boston area. Next slide, please. So here is our current state. So um, we have 40 inches of projected sea level rise coming at us. Um, we need to raise our harbor walk up by four to four and a half feet. And this is this uh, financial figure, $8.1 billion expected in direct physical damages and relocation associated with flooding in the seaport by 2070. And as I mentioned to you before, we are already seeing some damage uh, this early, which is nearly 50 years ahead of that. So uh, again, you can see here uh, our property on the right side of the um, slide here, and then Martins Park over to the left. Martins Park is actually a city park, but we work really collaboratively and closely with them. And then, of course, we have the Harbor Walk that runs along uh, both uh, uh, properties. And we uh, own that Harbor Walk on our side and maintain it. And we work closely with the city to maintain their part of the Harbor Walk. And then, of course, you see Seaport and Congress Street there. So next slide, please. So this is a bird's eye view of the plan, which I'm gonna tell you a lot more about. We also have, I think Zach Christo is, is here on the Zoom uh, from Sasaki, if we're able to let him talk at some point, he can tell you even more about it. But you can see that what we've created is a beautiful waterfront park. So as you all know, Boston Children's Museum's mission is to provide joyful discovery, exploration, and education for kids uh, birth to 10 and their families. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with us, um, we are 110 years old. We're considered one of the premier children's museums in the country. And we have probably served uh, around 30 million individuals uh, in our 110 years. So we are, we feel a strong responsibility to steward um, the next generation of climate activists and we do a lot of climate programming now in the museum. Um, we do a lot of waterfront programming as it is. So we knew that whatever plan we created would have to be extremely educational, would have to find an opportunity for kids and families to get down to the water. There are almost no areas, I don't think any at present, 
for children and families to really get down to the water um, and to provide an opportunity for exploration, for fun, for learning, and also resilience. So I will show you a, a 3D view next of this beautiful plan. So this is what we find really inspiring and breathtaking. So to the right of the plan, you see this waterfront park um, that sort of steps down deep towards the channel. This entire park is built on pilings. Um, so we don't anticipate an enormous amount of um, permitting difficulties. Um, this plan raises our harbor walk up by two feet and then gives us an additional two and a half feet of what we call passive protection. And I'll show you a closer view of that. But if you look um, at those, that sort of yellow line uh, along the property, that is seating that takes the protection up another two feet. Where they, you have the gaps in that seating, we would have to have deployable protection. But what we're trying to do is minimize the um, deployables as much as possible and really just have it be uh, passive uh, protection. So that park uh, on the right that I'm telling you about with the steps is floodable. And this would be a uh, property that would disappear during a flood event. And then as the channel drained would be uh, accessible for exploration and fun. And you see uh, our dock there. We currently have a dock that's part of our chapter 91. We have uh, floating islands there, those little orange and green uh, shapes there. And there's this large um, jutting out wharf, we call it uh, Children's Wharf, uh, which has uh, water hammocks in it that the children can like lay down on the wharf and see the water underneath. And uh, we have a, a three season pavilion next to the museum and some other amenities um, that will make the museum even more accessible and more fun for not only families uh, through the paywall, but also families and children walking by the museum who want to participate in our programming. And of course, you see the milk bottle there and our building um, that we own. Next slide, please. So this is just a kind of more creative picture of what it might look like on a sunny day um, to have families going down to the water. Of course, everything will be completely accessible uh, for people with disabilities and so forth. And um, you can see all the very verdant uh, greenery that's there. These would all be um, saltwater friendly plants um, that could be flooded. And this is an opportunity for kids to get down and look at the water, but also explore some of the, um, the uh, greenery that can grow in this kind of environment. Um, next slide. This is just a little picture of some of the stuff we're already doing at the museum out on the waterfront. So you can see our Fishing 101 program that we do with Save the Harbor. Um, we have now uh, a summer camp that we started during the pandemic. Um, we have a summer carnival. We do a lot of programming with the community on the water, kayaking and so forth. And um, so this is just, uh, this waterfront park that we're hoping to create will just increase our opportunities to really engage kids and families in the waterfront, to be proud of the Boston Harbor and learn how to take care of it as climate stewards. Next slide, please. And here is a closer look at some of the activities that we would be able to do in our new waterfront park. You can see on the left, that's the little step down area I mentioned to you, and they're doing a little music and movement class there. We have fishing, we have uh, exploration, um, of I guess those are little bird footprints there. And then on the right, we have um, some signage that's in, in, in encouraging kids to uh, observe and listen and learn. And uh, then we have the water hammocks there, which you have may, maybe seen in other places where the kids can really look under and see the tides, etc. cetera. Uh, you can go next slide, Travis. So this is um, showing you what our new front yard would look like. And you can see there on the lower left, the seating with the additional uh, foot or two of uh, the backs of the seating that provides this passive protection. Um, we will, uh, those of you that are familiar with the museum, you know this, we have a bay that's uh, not filled in at the front end of the museum, which you can see here will now become our new entrance. Um, and that would give us more room to uh, welcome the half a million visitors that we have each year. Um, 
and then you're looking at a, a, a plaza that is two feet higher and a harbor walk than it is now. And it'll be a slightly different shape as I think you saw in the aerial view. Next slide. So just assuming that we raise the outside plaza by two feet, we have to also raise the interior of the museum floor by two feet. So this is a picture of the lobby of the Children's Museum, otherwise known as the atrium. You can see on the far right there, the New Balance Foundation climb, which if you come to the museum, I'm sure you, your kids have been in it or you would be even gotten into it, but you can see how the lobby is up two feet. We cannot raise the lobby of the uh, old building, the wool warehouse. So you can see how the lobby is raised and then we step down these three steps. Um, there are uh, louver doors um, that uh, allow us to have indoor outdoor programming. And um, I think it will be really lovely to be able to, you know, we already have these garage doors that are here on the museum to open up to the outside, but we don't really use them that much because they're not really that functional. But this would give a beautiful indoor outdoor feel to the atrium of the museum, not only for the daily visitors, but for events. And we do a lot of events here at the museum. Next slide. This is a picture of our third floor of our museum. So if we uh, fill in the first bay, as I mentioned for our new um, entryway, we create this beautiful third floor pavilion, which again will allow uh, uh, visitors and event attendees to look out over the channel. You can see there the uh, Tea Party Ship Museum and the Boston skyline there. And um, at the back of this, you'll see some steps going up. So those of you that are in touch with the museum know that we now have an outdoor garden. It's called the Fenway Farm. It's built on a green roof that we already had. We have three levels of green roof. I should probably say the museum is lead gold. Um, it was the first museum building to be made lead gold in the city of Boston, as far as we know. But we do have a second floor green roof, um, which is a, a, a mini Fenway farm that we collaborated with the Red Sox on. So in order to make all these changes happen, we would create a much bigger farm up on the fourth floor of the museum. And that little stairway behind is the way up to the fourth floor green roof, which you can see in the next slide. And there we have our Fenway farm overlooking um, the Boston Harbor there and the channel and the skyline. Of course, there is a clear glass railing. We're not having people just jump off the roof there. Um, and uh, this would give kids an even greater opportunity to really experience the, um, you know, live gardening, planting, harvesting, and learning about how to grow their own food. And we have a really good collaboration on this program with Green City Growers and uh, with Love and Spoonfuls, where we give our produce to. So this would be quite an extraordinary thing to open up the roof of the museum um, if we were able to. Next slide. So we call this, um, this slide uh, the under the hood. So while we're doing all this very beautiful work uh, outside, we're protecting the neighborhood, we're providing an, an integrated area for children and families to enjoy the water. We have a lot to do in a, in a state of emergency right now to actually protect the interior of the museum. As I mentioned in the earlier slide, we are already taking water in, in our mechanical room, uh, at our loading dock. We have a lot of uh, groundwater uh, seepage into the um, crawl space of the museum. And if you look over at, to the far right, we're also getting water in to the doorways that are along our fire exits along Sleeper Street. So one of the important parts of the plan is to take care of all of this uh, extraordinary amount of work, which involves uh, relocating our utilities up to a higher floor, uh, reinforcing our uh, existing brick wall, um, creating a whole new set of drainage for our basement, um, two new water storage tanks, one on the south side and one on the north side of the building, and um, also adding new fill to our seawall. I didn't mention earlier, we did, as part of the investigation for the Sasaki plan, we did hire divers to go in and look at our seawall, which is over 100 years old. It may be... I don't even know how old it is, maybe 150 years old. Um, someone could put in the chat, who knows how old our seawall is. Uh, but uh, 
this is all part of the work that needs to go on sort of that's not going to necessarily be visible to the community at large. Um, and this is uh, very important to actually protect the day to day operations of the museum, because, you know, we have, as I said, almost half a million visitors each year and so many people rely on us for all kinds of purposes and um, we have to make sure we can keep the museum open. And this is what we are really working hard on now to try to at least uh, get this part of the work done, really try to protect the museum from the flooding we're already experiencing. Next slide. And I'm just going to leave you again with this really lovely picture, which shows the imagination of this plan. If you remember when Marty Walsh uh, presented his Climate Ready Boston plan, there was this idea of having this this verdant, uh, uh, you know, uh, areas that ring the channel that were beautifully green and verdant with green infrastructure that could make Boston Harbor even more accessible and beautiful than it is now. And we really took it to heart. Um, we decided, well, you know what? We're the Boston Children's Museum. People love to visit us. Why can't we have a beautiful, resilient waterfront park here that protects us and protects our neighbors? And actually it can be seen as a demonstration project of what can be done to really uh, protect Boston Harbor. And, you know, we've spent so much time over the last uh, several years talking with city and state uh, representatives, and they also see it somewhat as a demonstration project for how uh, resiliency can also be beautiful and engaging and um, inviting to Boston residents and tourists and the like. So that is the end of my presentation. And now we can go over to the questions. Thank you so much. And, and um, the necessity is the mother of invention, truly. That is sort of a understatement there. Um, do we have, um, are we getting David in here? We, David is there. Oh, is David there? Okay, yeah. great. All right. Well. Um, I'm just going to ask one question first to get it out of the way, and then Dave, I'd uh, love to hear from David. But um, how much is this going to cost? And what is the <laughs> line? okay, because everybody's asking. <laughs> I'm afraid to say. Um, well, you know, it's a moving target, but it's it's probably in the sixty million dollar range. Okay. It depends on when we get started, too, because you all know that you know uh, escalation takes the cost up and up and up. And do, so, you, uh, do you have a timeline? Uh, suppose you could start today, you know, how, how long do you think it would take? Oh, well, how long would it take to get done? Yeah. Um, that's a good question for Zach. I don't know if he wants to answer it or, or even Amy Auerbach, who I think is also on the call, our uh, uh, SVP of Finance Administration. But I, I think it's not terribly long. I think it's like probably a year and a half okay. to get it done. We, this plan does not necessitate us closing the museum for a terribly long time. Okay. Um, cause that was one of the requirements of the planning. And, and, and is there a number by which if you got to say 35 or 40, you'd be like, yes, we go, we can feel confident. We can. Yeah. Well, what we're trying to do now is raise 25 million for the phase one of the project, which would be the interior part, because, um, this is already what is, uh, starting to be troublesome here at the museum. Mm -hmm. um, some of the donors that are closest to us might want to help us protect the museum. The raising money for the outside, the waterfront park has been a little bit more complicated, as you can imagine. Um, as we're kind of out early on this, mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of other plans like this that are out this early. And um, we are finding it a little bit challenging to, uh, to raise money for that. It's not to say we won't be able to, but we'll see. <laughs> it's probably just worth noting that somewhat the timing is dependent on the fundraising. And so we've had to be very thoughtful about a phasing plan so that we can take action as soon as we can uh, on the more, as Carol put, you know, the immediate uh, items that we have that we need to protect. Uh, but ultimately, if we can raise the money, we want to do it in one um, effort, but that might not be possible. Yeah. That makes sense. So, so David, tell us, um, I know part of your role um, has been to bring along the various constituencies at the museum. So that would include the staff, the board, the visitors, the, the city, the state, you know, like everybody. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, who's, 
what that's been like, what your experience has been? Uh, well, I think uh, Carol summarized it well, you know, in 2018, really, when we had that Storm Riley, that was um, the moment that we all sort of sat up and said, okay, we've got to really look differently at this. As you can imagine, just from the board perspective, you know, we have a lot of governance uh, and we work very closely with a very talented leadership team. But, but typically, you know, say our facilities work is around more routine maintenance and what's a very old building. Uh, and we have a very limited operating budget. So we try to, you know, spend money wisely, but Storm Rally changed all that. And uh, the first step was to engage the board in, um, you know, a much longer term view of our role um, on the four point channel and how we have a sustainable museum that's there for children and families you know, for the next few generations, not just for the immediate future. So we had to really start a more long-term planning process around protecting the museum and having a sustainable um, building that we can uh, we can love and maintain. Did um, did you encounter resistance? I mean, this must have been sort of a three, uh, like a one hundred and eighty for the for the board who are just used to thinking about exhibits and children and you know all the wonderful you know the positive side that you think about normally um well i would say we we do have quite a diverse array of uh, people and expertise with the board so we do have some specialists who are really um you know leaders in this space who understand uh the longer term effects of climate change so you know we would have had individual members who would have been attuned to this issue but you're right the you know broader board would have been focused more on our mission than delivering uh what uh on our on our mission for children and families for the community um and our surrounding uh neighborhoods so that's that's really what they were focused on so yes initially as this came forward we got a lot of questions and there were a wide array of them, including, well, you know, why shouldn't we just move? I mean, why why would we stay here? Let's go find another location. Uh, this doesn't seem feasible. And so we have to wrestle with that question and consider alternatives. You know, is there an alternative location we could be in? Where, uh, what would that cost to do that? Uh, but ultimately we determined that uh, our primary role is to be a resource for the community. That's what we're here for. We're here to serve children, families in the city of Boston and uh, surrounding neighborhoods. And we want to make sure that uh, we didn't ever lose sight of that. So, you know, going to, you know, really the only feasible alternatives would be to find, you know, land and way outside of, you know, our current location. And that wasn't really going to serve our purpose and our mission. Plus, would that have been cheaper anyway? Well, yeah, that's debatable, too, because... Um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, there's a lot of costs involved in finding a new location and building either on an existing location or from scratch. And you can understand that one of the board's primary roles is um, making sure that we're a financially healthy organization. Uh, I think people may not realize it's a it's a very small but mighty organization. Carol and her team are fantastic. They <laughs> have such tremendous reach in the city of Boston, but our operating budget is just north of $10 million a year. Like we do not have a significant amount of resources available to us. We're a children's museum, you know, so uh, we had to really think about our board makeup and how we bring in the right expertise to help us navigate all the questions we had to answer yeah. around uh, how to govern a program like this and how to think about supporting the management team and ultimately making sure we had a sustainable location for the museum. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I personally, I'm glad that you stayed downtown, um, but I can, I can see how you would have been carefully considering all the options. I, I want to ask a question about, um, you mentioned this, Carol, the, um, the uncertainty at which we are experiencing climate changes. They are, seem to be coming faster than predicted. Mm. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and so, do, do you have flexibility? Do you have a plan B? Can you go faster if necessary? And related to that, what about your neighbors who are contiguous to you, especially behind you from Sleeper Street? Right. So first thing, um, let me just make note of that. So first thing, um, yeah, so going faster, um, the plan that Sasaki has designed can actually get us to 16 and a half feet. 
Okay. If we have to, we had some fun with um, Zach and Marta from Sasaki talking about 2070 and beyond when they turn the ground floor of the Children's Museum into a giant swimming pool. <laughs> so, so, so the, you know, you know, the idea of getting that far is a little bit, you know, hopefully we'll never get to that. But um, the going faster, what we're what we've decided to do, as David mentioned, is really focus on the interior of the building in, in a kind of phased, uh, phase one of getting this done. Because, you know, uh, we really have to address what is happening right now. And, um, and I, as I said, we can, we can make this plan get higher and higher. But, you know, I mean, all bets are off for all of us as you know, we see what the impact of this sea level rise is in our region. As far as our neighbors, so um, we have some wonderful staff here. Uh, my colleagues, Mike Travis and Charlene Merrill Smith and Amy Auerbach and Michelle Rankin, and uh, also Zoe Rivera. We're like a little internal uh, work group on this. And we have spent countless hours meeting with virtually everyone under the sun. I, I, we probably had several hundred meetings. And some of those have been with our neighbors down the Fort Point Channel. So, you know, we have Gillette, we have Related Beal, we have um, Honeyman, we have a number of other uh, property owners down this way. And then, of course, the other way, we have Martins Park, we have um, the uh, federal, uh, the courthouse and so forth. And, you know, it's a mixed bag. And I think this is where um, I think our, our new leaders in the city and the state are going to really help us. I think that it needs a higher level of um, intervention to get everyone on board so that you have these connections, the linkage, if you will. I know the Green Ribbon Commission has done a, a lot of great work. Um, uh, John Cleveland and Bud Riss did interviews with all the people around our side of the harbor and um, the channel. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. You know, some of the, new, the newer developments are actually building in resilience. Uh, some of the older uh, buildings are, are not really worried about it yet. Um, the federal courthouse hasn't really done anything yet. So as I said to you uh, earlier, we are kind of out ahead of this, at least on our side of the channel. As you know, uh, Mark Margulies and his colleagues are doing, you know, with the Wharf District project, um, they are really digging in. Uh, to get that linkage on the other side of the channel and the other side of the harbor. So that's a really good model for how this side of the uh, waterfront could actually all work together on one plan. I think that's what makes this uniquely challenging, I think. And you know, with Carol and the team have done tremendous work navigating <laughs> through all of these questions. But you can imagine, you know, the obvious questions we need to start now, but this would be very familiar to people on this call. But it raises all sorts of questions around um, coordination with other potential programs long term. So those are the questions the board got as well. So, you know, what about the, where is the city's plan? Where is the state's plan? Why would we have to do this ourselves? What about our neighbors? So you know, w why would we need to fund so much of this individually versus the ability to get support from others? And so you know, we did have to go through a large exploration, understanding, well, where exactly are these plans and how realistic are they in terms of helping us um, uh, for an event like this in the future? And that's to some extent where this phasing approach came in because these plans are continue to evolve. And I think there's a lot of good work and thought being considered around this, but at the same time, we have to act now too. At the same time, you're there on the water's edge today, now. Um, so uh, are you in favor of, um, a, you know, a business improvement district or some, some kind of like um, overlay that could that the city could potentially put on that would uh, compel everyone to share the cost? Yeah. I mean, you know, someone, I think, put in the chat that very question. You know, we are protecting a very large area of corporate um, development behind us. In fact, we're the only nonprofit on the Four Point Channel. So um, obviously, if there was some kind of bid, that would be fantastic. But this goes back to that overarching coordination that really has to take place at the city and state level in order to make that happen. But yeah, I mean, you know, we have, we have, uh, you know, someone asked a question in the chat about fundraising. I mean, we, 
We're trying to get some government funding, either from the city, state, or the federal government. Um, but we are so, also are going to some of our nearest and dearest friends who've supported the museum over the years and a number of foundations. But, you know, I think everybody is a little gun shy because they, they're waiting to see what kind of overarching initiative is going to be taking place here. And as many of you know, the um, Army Corps is now doing their own study uh, of how to protect Boston Harbor. So there's going to be more information related to that study, which I guess is coming down the pike in a couple of years. I think it was originally 2026, and now I think it's been moved back. Um, John Sullivan for Mass Water and Sewer. He's got his own plan for the Four Point Channel. Um, so this is why, again, we are, we're really going into this first phase of trying to protect the building, because regardless of all these other things going on around us, we have to make sure that our mechanical, uh, uh, our mechanicals and our electrical utilities are protected. Right. Yes. So you mentioned fundraising. So let's delve into that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I know that you have a amazing fundraising team and you're you're very successful. But this seems like a whole you know a whole beyond, right? Like, so what have you done differently, uh, and who are you going to, and how is it working out? Yeah, so I, I yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Dave. I, I just you want to go. start with one perspective to share. Well, first of all, it's you know this is 15, 20 times, like I said, uh, you know, our typical annual fundraising efforts. So it's far beyond what we we have great friends and donors, but this is a very different level. Um, and of even fundraising more, even more different than a than a campaign might be, like a regular campaign. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry uh, to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah. So. I mean, for those who are not as close to, you know, the actions that are underway in the city and with our, you know, all the partners we work with and board members would not be as close to this, you know, you get some very basic questions like, um, well, there's, we hear about, you know, federal infrastructure funding. Surely there's something we can apply for at the federal government level. Um, and you hear about um, state infrastructure programs and, and then, and so I think we've had to get very educated on uh, what's really possible and feasible and available. And, uh, and of course, uh, when you get to these larger programs, very many of them require coordination with other um, institutions in the city uh, in order to make them happen. So I think that that was just a fundamental thing that was new to us. You know, these are not placed sources of fundraising we would ever have considered in the past. And we've had to learn a lot and get educated on what's possible. And I think, you know, quite honestly, people had higher expectations than maybe what we realistically can accomplish through those types of initiatives in the near term. Carol, did you want to? Yeah, on? just to follow on for that. I think when we started on this, you know, five years ago, we we anticipated probably naively that there would be a lot more government funding available for this kind of project. And now we've really had our eyes open to the challenges that cities and states have related to climate change, because it's not only water um, flooding, it's also heat. And, you know, we have flooding. I, you know, Kim Driscoll was telling me the other day that, you know, we have serious problem with farming in the central part of the state where all the fields are being flooded and there's just so many different complex problems, you know, at the city and state level. Um, the other thing we learned is that, you know, people think a lot about FEMA. Well, like when Hurricane Sandy hit and New York uh, got all of that FEMA money, that is a post-disaster fund, which is very, very um, generous. The pre-fund, the pre-disaster money is much, much less. Right. These are called the BRIC grants. Um, and those are much harder to come by. And also, we do already have a brick grant in operation in the channel down near the uh, Gillette end. And that one has, has, has taken some time to even get started. So the FEMA grants really are not panning out um, that well. There are some grants. Uh, Coastal Zone Management does have a grant we're going to be applying for this year. And then, of course, there's uh, appropriations, either at the federal, state, or city level. And this requires a lot of you know, talking with our senator's office, talking with our uh, state senators and representatives, talking with the city. Um, it's just that it's not very fertile right now. <laughs> Let me just be very 
clear. So again, um, it's a little easier for us to go to our donors that are already funding uh, the museum to say, can you help us a little bit more in addition to what you already give annually? Can you help us to actually shore up the museum uh, from these flooding events that we are having here? So um, this is really, really hard. Yeah. Um, and I don't think as a general uh, community, we figured out how to help nonprofits, um, all of our museums and our cultural institutions and our other nonprofits and residents for that matter, to manage this expense of uh, shoring up their buildings um, with yeah, what's ahead. I would certainly um, agree with you. And on the federal side, um, you also are moving your mechanicals and you're doing some mitigation work. Um, I don't know if you would characterize it as that, but it seems, you know, there's some yeah. element of that. Can you go after IRA money or DOE money or, or is that just the same, the same thing? It's just very difficult. Yeah, the a lot of these grants, you know, uh, we've gotten, we've really uh, rolled up our sleeves and learned a lot about them. And Sasaki is an Arab and VHB have really helped us with that. A lot of these grants are very, very narrow. Um, and so our project doesn't really fit naturally into right. a lot of areas. It's not, I'm not totally pessimistic. I think that there may be the opportunity this coming 12 months that we will get some sort of appropriation or perhaps the cultural uh, coastal zone management uh, grant. Um, what those grants would do, they would help our funders feel a little more confident in giving money to us, knowing that it sort of has that seal of approval from the governmental side. Um, so and I think, you know, they feel they want to see some skin in the game right. from the other entities that oversee this area. It's almost like the entire grant making apparatus has to sort of <laughs> reposition itself to the new yeah. of, of what's necessary. So um, switching gears a, a, a little bit, many people are aware of the Fort Point Channel ideas put forth by Boston Water and Sewer. And yeah. the, what what are you, uh, can you just describe that very briefly? And then um, what do you, how would that affect Okay, you? I <laughs> hope I can. I'm not very technical, I'm an arts leader. But yeah, John Sullivan is a very, very good friend of ours. He was just here not long ago, about a month ago. And I think what the idea is, is to let the channel drain out at low tide and get ready for the overflow of the harbor during a major storm event. And um, I think it's a rather expensive plan, but I think at the moment, there are some people that think it's the best plan on the table uh, that could, um, protect um, the whole Boston Harbor because, you know, I mean, it's, it's a lot of coastal area. Of course, Massachusetts is a coastal state, so we have a lot of coast to protect, but the harbor uh, is gonna have a lot of flooding too. And we already know there's our friends at the aquarium are already getting flooding in the aquarium tea station and, you know, around Christopher Columbus Park and that whole area. So um, Mark Margulies are one of the other people or, or Zach or Marta could talk to you more about John's plan, but um, it is very ambitious. Um, John has told us directly that it wouldn't help us that much because the kind of regular flooding we're getting now with king tides and high tides is not going to be addressed by this by this um, plan of his. It really is for major nor'easter, major flooding storm events um, to protect the uh, the buildings around the harbor. So we're going to have to do this anyways. Okay, so so just to be clear on his, it drains out at low tide. You shut some sort of gates, right? That yeah. Is, so the Fort Point Channel is empty, and then as Boston Harbor rises and over, you know, you can let it run back in. It serves as a holding tank. That, or a yes, that's then, the bathtub they call it. I'm looking in the chat now to see if anyone is going to save me on this one. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think, I think you're good. Um, but um, it, it, the person here is like, can you talk more about that? It seems like it might affect the buildings along Fort Point Channel a lot. What I hear you saying is not really only during extreme, you know, storms. Yeah, you mean help help us a lot? I think just says during. Effect. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, sure. I think during extreme events, it will. Uh, you know, I mean, I haven't seen all the drawings and everything. And John has been doing a great job of talking to people about it. And I guess 
it's it, it it's it's getting a higher profile this plan um in the absence of anything else oh here's zach thank you zach zach, zach is writing something in the, the chat here what is he saying it can hold inland rainwater during storm events as a large detention basin beautifully said um so it's really for storm water that oh, will is, oh john is on too oh, look john, john sullivan okay. is here panel will be used to store storm water which right. has no place to go when there is an extreme high tide and it's raining yeah so it's okay. really for runoff in yeah. the city yeah thank you so, john thank you zach yeah thank you very much <laughs> um and you oh can he's got it. uh he's got a website here yeah bwsc storm viewer dot com um maybe uh if you put that in the well i guess it's in the chat you can see it um so um let's see what else do we have here um i think we haven't really touched on the um subject of reg of the regulations and how you've been um you know walking through that, that oh yeah that i can talk about that yeah. Amy, I just want to, um, someone wrote me in the chat that the chat is only going to the hosts and panelists. Is that right? The people aren't able to see the chat. I can see um, it, but I, but that might be some. Don't I, th that probably must, if they think it is true, then it must be true. Um, maybe what you can do is send the uh, chat to everyone so after send the chat later. I mean, it's mostly questions. I will say um it's up there uh john's uh, John, email who has answers which is good yeah john um, sullivan's bwscs bwsc storm stormviewer.com okay so a regulations so um so that's a really good question okay so you know there are many 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 entities that regulate activity along the coastline and in the water and one question that David asked me um, early on was, if we raised all the money, could we even do this plan? And we agreed uh, to let the board know the answer to that very good question, because in good faith, you know, we can't really um, we can't really get going on fundraising and then find out that none of this is is possible. So we had an extraordinary opportunity that I, I guess is becoming legendary in Boston lore. We had what was we called an interagency meeting. And this this was the result of a meeting we have with Secretary Tepper and Lisa Berry Angler and others uh, at, at the state level. Um, they agreed to organize a meeting for us with DEP, DCR, uh, Coastal Zone Management, Army Corps, um, Fisheries and Wildlife, Mass Energy and Environmental Affairs, and all of these these entities in one meeting. And um, this took place about three months, no, maybe now six months ago now, uh, maybe even a little longer. And we were very fortunate to have um, uh, Stephanie Cruel from BHB on the call and Zach um, and Marta from Sasaki. And we presented our plan from the permitting standpoint to all of these entities. And uh, Stephanie was able to answer a lot of their questions about it. They expressed a number of concerns. Uh, toward the end of the meeting, I asked the rather audacious question of do, although we are not making an application at the moment, does anyone see any, uh, you know, red lights here? Anything that we should really be concerned about that may not be able to be permitted. And of course, they're, you know, these people are not going to make a, a, a solid gold promise, but they did say they don't see any uh, red flags was the term. Um, they didn't see any particular red flags. And I think this is uh, partly because the, um, the park, the waterfront park is being built on pilings, which are already, um, you know, very frequently seen along the uh, harbor. And we already have pilings here. Uh, for the Harbor Walk and so forth. Um, but uh, so, you know, not knowing the exact detail, we decided it was it was okay for us to go ahead and fundraise that, you know, we, we don't have any major red flags as far as we know at this point. Yeah. And was, was the city part of that as well? Yeah, I think, um, I can't remember exactly whether uh, Chris Osgood was on that call. 
Yeah. Um, no, they weren't actually. They weren't. The city wasn't on the call. We actually uh, took notes and we gave them a very detailed report. And we are working really closely with the city, and they have been just wonderful and very supportive. You know, Chris and and Allison Brezius and uh, Rich McGinnis, and uh, now we're going to have Brian Sweat, who's a good friend. Right. So I, I they've been very very supportive of our plan, and I know the mayor is aware of it too. Um, so, uh, everyone has been really, really supportive. Um, it's just a question of whether they have any resources to help us with. And at the present, they right. don't. Or, or whether they would, um, which it doesn't sound like they are being, but they could be an obstacle, right? If they, if they wanted to. So far they haven't. In fact, oh, they've no. given us, uh, you know, letters of support and they've, they've helped us, um, think about where we might be able to apply to. They've been extremely, extremely helpful and supportive. Yeah. Um, at, at, at this point. So, so far, we're really happy that's, with that. That's, that's great. That's uh, very good to hear. And of course, Allison Brizius has now gone over to Coastal Zone Manager. I know. Continue to spread her good yeah. will and good works. Um, well, we have about uh, just a few minutes left here. And let me just go back to the chat for just a moment. Um, let's see. Okay, okay, talk a little bit, if you would, about your relationship with the you know the the stake other stakeholders as you would define them like are there are there community groups are there you know yeah them? i saw sarah mccammons on this call um you know we're working really closely with four point neighborhood association and other neighbors here um you know it's really important that everyone understands that we're trying to do our best to help the neighborhood. And um, a, a lot of what we do is talk to people who are affected by um, this problem on the channel to make sure that they uh, agree with our plan. And we, we've presented it to the Four Point Neighbors. And um, as it evolves, we'll continue to do so. Mm -hmm. um, we just want them to know that we are here as an anchor institution in, in this area, we're not planning to go and we really want to help uh, protect their properties and their beloved community areas. Um, so, um, and as far as the other stakeholders at the state and the city, we have a close relationship with, um, I mentioned Secretary Tepper, we're looking forward to meeting Secretary Hoffer. Um, we know all of our city uh, folks. Um, and even our federal representatives, you know, uh, Congressman Lynch's office and uh, our two senators, um, Ayanna Presley, you know, everyone has been really, really um, positive and supportive and encouraging. And uh, it takes us a lot of time, especially our little internal waterfront team, to keep them up to date on um, everything that we're doing. Yeah. Um, and David, I, I suppose you would say that your job is to keep the board informed. You've done a, a really fantastic job of putting it on the agenda. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, only just that it's, you know, has some, so much significance, you know, to the long term health of and sustainability of the museum that, uh, you know, we obviously keep it front and center and keep everyone apprised of the progress that the team is making. And you can tell from Carol's comments, you know, we're lucky we're such a community-based organization because in a way we, that is allowing us to, we're naturally we're very good at working with all the partners around us, but we've had to take that to a whole new level. The team's just been fantastic at figuring out how to do that. But at the same time, yeah, there's a lot of education that has to happen. And uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of risk for the museum because, you know, what's First and foremost, we're a resource for, like I said, for children and families. So we have to make sure that all of this is financially viable, that we can, if we start something, if we put a shovel in the ground, that we can finish it and still be a healthy organization financially that isn't uh, putting the long-term health of the museum in jeopardy. And and, yeah. and you, you, of course, have a whole world outside of the museum. Um, what do you, what do you hear from people? You know, you go around and trying to raise money and so on, what are you hearing? Um, you know, I wanted to mention um, one of our really close partners is Joe Cristo and his uh, team at, at the Stone Living Lab and of course, Kathy Abbott in Boston Harbor now. And we're doing a lot of educational work with them too, which is, is really important. Um, so what are we hearing? Well, <laughs> it's sort of a mixed message. I think on the one hand, uh, people feel like 
this is a serious problem and we're we're taking a, we're, we're investing a lot of time and effort and money in trying to solve it for ourselves and for our neighbors and at the other hand uh, we're hearing that you know it's just we're a little bit out ahead of everyone and there just isn't really the infrastructure yet to support pro uh, projects of this scope <coughs> so um but we just keep barreling on <coughs> Well, and 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 there might not be until a project of this scope gets going and starts trying. So you know. Well, that's it. I mean, I think if we, you know, we're always hoping at some point someone will call me up and say, "Hey, you know, I've got uh, fifty million dollars, and you know, we're gonna do something for you." I mean, that would be just so amazing. But slowly but surely wins the race, and we know that the magic bullet method of fundraising doesn't really work very well. Um, so incrementally, we were trying to uh, raise more and more funds. We did have a very generous uh, anonymous grant to start this all off to help us with our schematic plans and our concept plans. Um, and so we're, we're, we're using that as, as, as carefully as we can. But, you know, pretty soon we're going to actually have to raise the money for getting the work done. And that's, you know, been something of a heavy lift. And the board is is very engaged and and our philanthropy department is very engaged in that good um uh david any other comments on that no i think carol summarized it well i think uh we you know we've always been a leader in the museum space but this has taken us into new territory and uh you know it's just it's a really credit to uh the community uh of boston and and particularly our our team that's been dedicated to figuring this out. Um, the amount of progress we've been able to make has been substantial, but yeah, I think more than anything, there's just a lot of education required and we are, we do seem to be out ahead of it and that uh, it's helpful to continue to push forward, but, you know, we'd like, like to see a little bit more support too, so that we can make sure that uh, we're not just dealing with another event where we're trying to clean something up, we'd rather be proactive as, and we're going to stay on the front yeah. foot to do that. Completely. All right. You have been heard. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, on. Amy. Thank you for inviting us. We might check back with you in a year. I hope there are no serious winter storms this year um, and, hurric and uh, hurricanes and northeasters. I guess nor'easters are the ones that bother you the most. But um, congratulations for everything that you're doing. And I will say to our audience, please, um, we have today at noon another GRCX about the uh, collaborative climate action planning that we've been doing. So if you are not as far along as the Children's Museum you, and you don't know exactly what to do next, come to that, learn, and we'll see you at noon. And thank you again. And thank you to the audience. We'll send out the notes. And the and Thank the you. All right. Thank bye -bye. you so much, Amy. Thanks, Bye. Amy. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.